Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast. This is your host, Brittany, and today's episode is on skin conditions and pet dermatology. We are joined by a very special guest. Dr. Millie is joining us on this episode. So good morning, Dr. Millie. How are you? Good, good. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, absolutely. So um, for the listeners who maybe haven't seen you yet, which we found you on Instagram, um, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. So I am um, a veterinary dermatologist, and I think that is something that a lot of pet owners don't realize that in veterinary medicine, there are all sorts of specialists now. So my main focus is problems um, in animals with um, just skin issues, primarily dogs and cats, um, but I learned about just about every other species. And um, besides skin, though, we also deal with issues that might affect the, the hair or coat, nails, and ear problems. And maybe something we'll talk about that a lot of jogs, especially with ear problems, it's connected to um, a skin issue and allergy. And I practice in Miami, Florida. I have a business here. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't really think about pet dermatology, you know, until honestly, until I kind of stumbled up- upon your Instagram but it does make sense. It's just like with humans, you need these specialty practices, especially when it's so important to a dog's health or longevity. You know, we have dermatologists as humans, so it makes perfect sense. Um, so what are some of the most common skin conditions you see or hear about? So the most common conditions that I am managing are dogs and cats with allergies. Um there's a, a slew of other conditions, autoimmune, hormonal conditions, congenital conditions, but by far, I would say like 80 to 90% of the patients I see are having issues with allergies. So they're itching, scratching, rubbing, chewing, licking on their body. And um, it's due to several different allergies. Um, you know, there's flea allergy, there's food allergy, and probably the most common one is environmental allergy. Um, and then with that said, dogs with allergies, especially food and environmental allergies, are prone to getting ear infections, which is something, especially through my um, Instagram, I like to educate about because I think a lot of owners don't realize, a lot of pet owners actually dog owners, because dogs get more ear infections than cats, that ear infections are usually due to an allergy problem. And um, and so that's something else I see quite a lot of. It's just dogs with just chronic ear issues and um, even getting to the root cause of all that. So you mentioned some of the, like, the biggest contributors for allergies, so flea allergies, food allergies, environmental what are some of the other um, contributors to skin issues or to allergies that you normally see in dogs? Or is that kind of the the top ones that you mentioned? Yeah, I would say those are the top ones. I mean, there's other things like, and it's really not as common, you know, like mosquito allergies or there's contact allergies and kind of like the poison ivy for humans. There are certain weeds and you know in your grass that could cause a contact allergy but really the most common are flea allergy and, and depending on which part of the country you're on and like i'm in the united states i'm in south florida where there's fleas everywhere um but though i'm sure there's areas of the world where there's just fleas is a big issue um is a big one and and i'll have to say is like when your veterinarian is telling you to make sure your pets on on flea prevention it, it is important because some dogs are sensitive to fleas and 
a few flea bites could make them extremely itchy and then they get lesions, infections. And, um, and, and I know it's a hard one for clients to, to, to digest that they have fleas, um, in their home, but, but it is a big contributor to itchiness. Um, food is another one. I, I will say if anything, flea and environmental are, are more common, but food can, and it's not that the client is feeding the wrong food. Um, so I do want to say that it's just that, you know, for maybe genetic reasons or for whatever reason, the pet will just suddenly develop an allergy to what it's eating and, um, and it will manifest it as a skin problem. It, it could manifest it as a digestive problem, maybe vomiting, mm-hmm. diarrhea, but it can also present itself as a dog being itchy or a dog getting ear infections. <clears throat> And then there's the environmental, which, you know, I live um, in South Florida, so it's very tropical here. And so I think maybe that's a reason why I see so many issues with environmental um, in certain areas of, I'm sure, the United States and maybe more of a, a seasonal thing. But you could still get, when I say environmental, I also want to point out that it could be dust mites that are in your home. So many dogs and cats are allergic to that. And so it could still make your dog or, you know, your, your cat itchy year round because dust mites are not a seasonal thing. And as far as environmental, would you consider maybe like certain cleaners or um, detergents or things that we're using in our house? Do you see those sometimes also being irritants? Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I get that question quite a lot. And and I would say that's more of an irritant, um, not so much like the chronic itchy dog that we see all the time. So let's say you cleaned your floor with like pine sole and shortly after your you know, your dog was laying on the floor, then yeah, within probably within a few minutes, within a few hours, you might see your dog's skin get red or itchy because it was an irritant at, at that moment that contacted it. Not so much so um, <clears throat> this is chronic itchiness that we see in dogs. So it's kind of that time frame there. But it's not. It's, I mean, so like some clients will ask about, you know, maybe they spray Febreze a lot or, you know, they have a lot of um, candles out and stuff like that. Um, it could, but honestly, it's really not the most common reason why we'll see a dog itchy. Okay. That's actually, I mean, pretty good news because when you think about a human being itchy or getting a rash, you're like, oh, did I change my detergent? Did I change my soap? Uh, you know, different things like that. So that's that's kind of good to know. It's a, l- a little bit reassuring. And kind of to that point, whenever you are trying to discern what the itchiness or allergy is from, do you go through like a, like a food testing or like the skin allergy testing like you would on a human, or does it look a little bit different for dogs? Yeah, so that's another good question. Um, So there isn't a reliable allergy test that's going to tell you if your dog has a food allergy or environmental allergy. Um, And kind of how the process works is it's a little bit we have to kind of get information from the pet, like what age this started. We have to examine the pet and look at the distribution of, of the lesions and where the pet is itchy at. Um, and so, for example, a dog that is very itchy on the back half of its body, so the back trunk or on the tail, the back legs, maybe the groin area, um, and that's the primary area where they're itchy, the majority of the time that's a flea allergy. Even though you don't see the flea on the pet, the uh-huh a common distribution for um, a pet to have a flea allergy. And so we don't need a, an allergy test to tell us that. We we examine the pet and we, we see that. And especially so if a client tells us the pet is not on a flea preventative, that just kind of, you know, you know, puts the alarms in my head like, okay, well, let's make sure your pet doesn't have a flea allergy and, and do a, um, flea prevention. And we talk about treating the home for fleas and making sure all the other pets are on flea prevention. If there are other pets in the home, um, it's not just that one pet. Um, and then food allergy and environmental allergy, 
um, they mimic each other. They, they they could cause rear end itchiness like flea allergy, but they will cause other areas of the body to be itchy too, like the paws, the face, it can affect the ears. And so in a dog or cat where that itchiness and distribution of lesions is year round, then it, it's hard to say, is this food or environmental? So we always look at food first. And the way we do that is with a diet trial. And um, and it should be a diet trial that's um, a, a prescription diet trial. So none of the pet store diets um, are made to test for food allergy. And we go through you know, about three months of a diet change. And if the pet improves significantly, resolves of its skin issues and its itchiness, then, then it's a food allergy. So that is the only way, the gold standard way to look at food allergy is through this diet change. And if that pet then, let's say, doesn't get better on the diet trial, then the only other allergy left is environmental. So environmental is an allergy that we diagnose out of exclusion. And I know that's a hard one for a lot of clients to understand because I know in the human side, they'll run and do like, you know, a, a blood allergy test and kind of mm -hmm. tell you what it'll just, it's not that way in, in animals. We can't extrapolate that to the animal side. It, it's a bit of a process. And I know clients come in super frustrated, like I need to know what this is. And, right. um, and it takes, it, it takes time to imagine you, especially, and, and the key is if you have a dog that's just itchy all year round, that that could be food, that could be environmental, and we kind of have to go through that sort of three month three month diet trial process, which can take a while, and hoping very much that the client has kept the pet very strict on that prescription food, and then if they don't do better, they're not better, then it's environmental, and so then when we now know it's environmental, then we can do an allergy test and we can either do a blood test or if you talk to most dermatologists, they will do a skin allergy test, which is similar to the human skin prick test that people get done on their arm or on their back. And the point of that test, and again, this is confusing um, for pet owners, is not to tell me the pet has environmental allergies. I, I already knew that because I ruled out the food through the diet trial and maybe I put that pet on good flea control and it still kept being itchy so it doesn't have fleas as a cause. So the point of that allergy test is now to narrow down what it is in the environment that's making that pet itchy. So mm -hmm. like in my area of South Florida, is it the palm trees? Is it the mango trees? You know, is it the ragweed grass? Is it the Bermuda grass? You know, what exactly is it so that I can formulate a vaccine and teach the client how to give their pet allergy vaccines, which, um, which now come as either injectable or drops that you can put in their mouth. So the point of the test is really for therapy so that we can try to desensitize the pet of its allergies. It's, um, it's a process that takes a while. It could take a year to two years for a client to see improvement um, or maximum improvement, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a client that doesn't want to do that, maybe can't afford the allergy testing, can't afford the time commitment to those vaccines, um, busy lifestyle, maybe they travel, they, they just cannot do the vaccines, then maybe that's not the route for them to go. Um, so, so that's important. And, you know, we have always have long discussions with the client, making sure that they're making the right decision because we don't want them to spend the money on a test and, and the time commitment for vaccines. And then it doesn't work because they just forget to do it, they, they're just, um, or they start off with good intentions and then they just, it, it, it falls through. Mm -hmm. So right. So that allergy testing that maybe a lot of clients hear about is more it's done or it should probably be done once we know the pet has environmental allergies and because the client 
wants to desensitize their pet of their allergies. So sticking kind of on this allergy theme, because that's kind of what we've been talking about, what are some of the signs that your pet might have an allergy issue? And I know that might be somewhat of an obvious question. You know, obviously, if they're scratching, they seem itchy, maybe if their skin looks irritated. But are there some other telltale signs that your pet is suffering from an allergy? Yeah, so those are the ones... um... The biggest sign is being itchy, lesions on their skin, usually induced because they're licking, chewing, rubbing. Um, a big one I think that clients don't understand is um, or, or don't realize is that a dog that licks their paws is is itchy. And sometimes that's confused with grooming or maybe a behavioral, but the majority of the time it, it's a pet that's that's itchy. Um, ears, so I brought that up again, and I want to keep bringing that up um, because ear infections can be a sign of an allergy, and it could be the only sign of an allergy. So the pet's body may be completely normal and not itchy, um, and the ears may actually not even be bothering the dog that much other than the owner sees the ear red and it's smelly, and maybe they're shaking their head, so that's the sign of itchiness. But ear infections, one ear infected could be a sign of, of allergies. There is a small percentage of dogs that don't itch. So when I say itch, I mean scratching, licking, chewing, rubbing. But they just get what we call recurrent skin infections. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be a sign of an allergy. So they'll get like little sores and crusties, um, bumps on their body. And and it's sometimes amazing because I'll see them and I'll be like, wow, so you would think this dog is itchy, but they're not. Now, mm -hmm. there are other conditions that could do that too that are much more common, like hormonal conditions if, if the age fits. But I have seen, um, you know, a small group of dogs where their food allergy was due to what's causing their, their recurrent skin infections. So if you notice your dog has the skin irritations, they're itchy, maybe they had a few ear infections. At what point would you say you need to see your vet? And then on the same token, before you see your vet, is there anything you normally would recommend that they do over the counter before they come in? I, I would say from the get-go, you should see your vet. If, if you're okay. seeing your dog um, itching, um, again, all the signs of itching, licking, rubbing, chewing, you, you should go see your vet. Um, with ears, automatically, I mean, there's really nothing over the counter. I, would, I wouldn't ever put anything in dog's ear <clears throat> that is not prescribed by your vet. Um, sometimes when dogs get ear infections, their eardrum can break. And if you put the wrong thing down in their ear, it could, you know, damage their ear. They can lose their hearing. Um, it's what we call ototoxicity. But I, um, you know, if, if a client couldn't get into or pet owner couldn't get into their vet, fast enough, you know, because I know there's vets are super busy nowadays, um, you know, maybe just doing a bath with an oatmeal shampoo might kind of get your pet comfortable and kind of buy you some time to get to your vet. But I think in general, you you should, a pet owner should see their vet and, you know, start asking, like, could this be allergies and, you know, get to the bottom of it. And in general, for all dogs, but I'm going to say especially so for certain breeds, like, and because I see them a lot, like French bulldogs, English mm -hmm. bulldogs, um, cocker spaniel is a big one with ears, because you really want to nip that allergy early before it just turns into this chronic condition, chronic mess, or, or you end up at a dermatologist's office. You know, th there's a lot of things your primary vet can do um, to just, you know, get your pet to be more comfortable and, and not get to the point because I, I feel like I kind of see the worst of the worst where they have no more hair, they have all these sores. Um, what ends up happening with many dogs with allergies and especially environmental allergies is that they're very prone to getting skin infections. And so as soon as they get itchy, they'll lick and chew. And then like within probably a few days, few weeks, they get a skin infection. 
Mm-hmm. And so now the skin infection is making that pet very uncomfortable. It's adding to the level of itchiness. And it's like you're in this roller coaster here. There's the allergies, there's the infection. Mm-hmm. And so um, it it's really, it's crucial to just get in and start managing that allergy early on um, before things just start to get out of hand, get too expensive too. So, um, yeah. So kind of switching gears here on something that I think this question comes up often and uh, most people don't know how to deal with it. So hot spots. So if you can tell us what is a hot spot, because I don't know if I even know how to correctly define a hot spot, you know, how do they happen? And then what do you do about those? Yes. So there is a lot of confusion about hotspots and the true hotspot. So kind of the medical term is pile traumatic dermatitis. It's, it's like a skin lesion that occurred pretty acutely, like pretty suddenly. Um, and, and it's probably very scary for the owner to see, but, but it's, the dog got so itchy that it made a raw spot, like a very irritated red, almost seeping lesion. Typically on the rear end, um, there are some dogs that will cause it on the, their face, the side of their face. So they'll take maybe their back paw and just really roughly scratch on the side of the face. But it, it meant something made that dog pretty itchy pretty quickly. And the majority of the time, it's a flea allergy, especially because it's happening on the back. But mm-hmm. if it's happening on the, the face area, then it may be a sign that the ear, um, there's an ear infection. So that's the true hot spot. It's like an acute lesion. It's like you saw your dog at one moment, everything was fine. And maybe like two hours later, it's got this ugly sore. Um, and, and, and it's awful. They are frantically itchy. They are miserable. It's almost considered like an emergency because your dog, you feel like your dog is going to rip its skin apart. And I could see where those, yeah, you want to run to an emergency clinic so they can give you some meds so they could stop that itching. Or if you couldn't, then you need to get one of those e-collars or lampshades to to mechanically break that that itch. But that's the true hot spot. Um, I do get clients who come in and say, oh, my dog has bunch of little hot spots all over its body and, and I know for sure that's not the true <laughs> right. definition because there's no way <laughs> mm-hmm. they, that could be but sometimes it's confused with the little crusties maybe little tiny sores very minor um over the body and, and those are not those are probably just secondary bacterial infections um the the true hot spot is is almost like an emergency. It's it's just really kind of dramatic to see it on on your dog, and um, and then like I said, if, if you see that, um, I, I it's it warrants running to your vet pretty quickly because they they are miserable. Okay, yeah, that's actually really helpful. I think that'll really help people because people see a hot spot and they they assume it's just a like an acute almost like if we had a scab from something and they're like, well, I'll just leave it or I'll put Vaseline on it or, you know, that type of scenario, not fully understanding what it might be or what it might lead to, um, especially with that level of discomfort. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, So what, just generally, um, what are some tips that you would give people to keep their um, dog's skin healthy? So... I guess general tips to keep a dog's skin healthy, um, and again, you know, not having any allergies or what, just feeding it a good balanced diet. Um, that's important. A dog's skin needs a certain level of, of proteins, a certain needs a certain level of like fatty acids to just stay normal for the coat to be normal. So so making sure your pet's on a a good brand, good balanced diet. Um, and I get asked a lot about, should we be adding supplements? And I mm-hmm. don't think it's necessary if your dog is eating a balanced diet. Um, there are some nutritional skin disorders like a zinc deficiency, vitamin A, D, there's a bunch of those, but honestly, you need to just 
see your vet and your vet diagnoses your pet with that, that it needs that that supplementation. Um, if, if we do diagnose a dog with environmental allergies, um, we do recommend fatty acids, fish oils, because those have anti-inflammatory properties that can help with the allergy. But the regular dog or cat out there that doesn't have any issues, I don't think it's necessary. Um, I just think feeding a good balanced diet is going to do it. Um, another one would be, should you bathe a dog? You know, I don't think it's wrong to bathe your dog. If you wanted to keep your dog nice and clean um, and doing a weekly bath with the right um, shampoo, like a hypoallergenic or an oatmeal shampoo, I, I think that's perfectly fine. I also think it's perfectly fine if a dog is you know, doesn't get dirty and it's a normal dog that you don't need to bathe it. But, mm -hmm. um, but if you wanted to, I don't, I don't, I'm not opposed to um, bathing once a week. I know there's a lot of misconception with it's going to strip the oils. Um, I don't think that's the case if you use the, the right shampoo. If you do have a dog that needs growing, you know, like doodles and poodles and Yorkies that you definitely keep up with that because sometimes all that you're not, then all that matted hair could potentially, you know, be an issue or issue of discomfort for the pet. So, so that may, you know, knowing your breed well, and if you do have a breed that needs frequent grooming, then definitely, you know, keeping, keeping up with that, or actually even before you get a dog reading about the breed, and if it's one that needs <laughs> frequent grooming, and you don't think you have the disposable income to afford that, that, the, you know, that maybe that's not the, the right pet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think the diet part is, is, uh, is an important one, just feeding a good balanced diet. Yeah, that makes sense. And the grooming part, it's kind of funny you mentioned that. I have Pomeranians and I bathe them maybe once a year. Um, they don't really need it. They're inside dogs. I groom them uh, like once a week and I cut their hair every two to three weeks. Um, I stay on top of their grooming, so they really don't need bathed that often. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I kind of like that you threw that out there because I do know people who are like, I'm bathing my dog once a week. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. All dogs are different, especially if you are playing in the mud and you're swimming in the pond or the lake or the ocean and have to have those baths. So um, I like that you threw that in there. That's great. Yeah. So. Um, final thing, uh, where can people find you on social media? And um, do you also have a website where people can find you? Yes. So my website is my business name. So it's MiamiVetGerm.com. And on social media, I kind of go by Got Itchy Pet. And I'm on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And so I, I do put a lot of posts. Um, initially, it was kind of geared towards veterinarians to teach veterinarians how to be good dermatologists. Um, but um, we've gotten a lot of followers, pet owners. So it, it does have a lot of good info there, too, for, for pet owners just to learn about skin conditions and ear conditions and, you know, what, what you could do. Or maybe you don't realize that what your pet has is something important that you needed to run to your vet to, to see. Um, mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all of this information. It was extremely helpful. You debunked some of the myths and um, really just told a lot of dog owners probably what they needed to hear. Maybe they didn't even know they needed to ask it or they didn't, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So I think that was really helpful. So I appreciate you being on the episode. Yeah. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah. Well, well thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.